Hey Spain lovers, so we bought an apartment in Madrid. Yes, this apartment that we're standing in right now. We bought it last February, that's right, right before COVID. So for those of you who don't know us, we are James and Yoli and we make videos that help you explore Spain like a local, whether you are visiting or planning to live here. And I know a lot of you out there are thinking about what it might take to buy a house in Spain. So we wanted to make a real step-by-step -step video to help you understand what it takes to buy a house in Spain, all the terms, all the steps to really demystify it for you guys. So we're gonna share our experience and there is so much information that we have divided it into two videos. So this video is really gonna be about the search, about first of all, how much money do you need so you can start to narrow down the kind of house you can buy. And then it's everything about where you should live, city, rural, should you buy new or secondhand, what should you watch out for when you're visiting apartments, what kind of features you want in your apartment. It's all the steps that we went through to take you to that moment where you found your ideal house. And then next week we will release the second video which is all about the process of buying a house. You know, contracts and legal advice, all of this. And to help you get to grips with this whole process, we've created a Spanish home buyers checklist which you can download. There's a link in the description below. And this checklist Checklist. It's not a replacement for the videos because we'll go into more detail here, but it will help kind of give you a structure and a written form of all the steps to consider and go through when you're buying a home. One thing I do want to mention is that we are going to share with you how much we paid for our apartment here in Madrid. I feel like that's already, that's kind of so often what people want to know because it helps give them context. So once we've gone through, well, at the end of this video, we will let you know because by then you'll have some context about kind of what kind of apartment we bought. And so it'll all make sense for you. So first of all, can someone from overseas buy a house in Spain? We do get a lot of questions about this in our Instagram accounts. Mm -hmm. And yes, you definitely can buy a house in Spain even if you are from overseas and are overseas. There is just a few extra steps in the process that we will be talking about in this second video. So you're all good. Obviously, do you have the money? Now that's uh -huh. point two that we're gonna go over now. So number two, how much money do you need to buy a house in Spain? Which is really a question about how do mortgages work effectively? Obviously, if you have all the cash for the purchase price, just, you know, walk in with your with your briefcase <laughs> and what you know do you accept cash and go for it so what about the mortgages now generally what happens is, is if you are a resident in Spain it's different from if you're a non-resident in Spain so in our case we are residents and so banks will offer up to 80% of the purchase price in a mortgage. So you'll have to put a down payment of, of 20%. And that was what we did. We had to put down 20% in cash for the purchase price and the bank covered 80%. Plus? Well, there's some extras on there as well. But just because you've got 20% doesn't mean you can go outright and buy the house because actually there's there's fees, there's taxes, there's, there's a tax for buying a house which is on top of that 20%. Let me break it down because this stuff can get confusing. So if you bought 100,000 euro house, this is for residents, you would put down say 20,000 as your deposit, but then you'd need about another 10 grand on top of that to pay for the taxes to buy the house and all the fees and the registrar and this, that and the other. So generally a good guidance is to have about 30% of the total purchase price if you're a resident. Now here's the thing, if you're a non-resident, the bank will ask for more of a deposit. So it could be 30 to 40% deposit instead of that 20%. Alexander actually recently told me from Pro Spain that because of the situation with COVID, banks are asking for about 50%. So you're gonna right. need half the price in cash. Wow. If you're a non-resident, you are gonna need more than if you're a resident. So you have to have more saved up. And another thing to consider also is that the monthly mortgage payment can't be over 40% approximately of what you earn on a monthly basis. Mm. So that's something to take into account as well. Yeah. Now again, if you're a non-resident, I'm not 100% sure how that kind of calculation works and might be a little bit more complex, but that was, that was the case for us. So number three, when is the best time to buy? Pretty much when you're ready, right? But a recent report says that property prices are going to go down from six to nine percent uh, in 2020 and 2021 because of COVID. Obviously. Because of COVID, of course, the crisis, and they will only start rising maybe uh, by 2024. Mm -hmm. So really, when is the best time? Well, it depends on what you're feeling, whether you feel it's the right moment for you. But just keep in mind that um, house prices are going to drop because of COVID. And one actually little point that was in that report is a lot 
lot of that drop in house prices is going to be reflected in secondhand homes and homes in touristy areas particularly because there's no tourists there's a, there's a lot less demand there so number four like where should you live in spain well i feel like that really comes back to the kind of experience that you're looking for are you looking to buy in a city you know a capital city like like we did or maybe barcelona or are you looking for a sunny village somewhere in southern spain that's a question you really need to answer yourself doing a bunch of research. Obviously our experience is more about buying an apartment in the city. So we can speak about that. So considering the kind of house we wanted, we couldn't really afford to buy in the historic center. Mm. So we had to move out a little bit. So for us, our reference was the ring road called M30. So mm. just outside that, that's the areas where we were looking at. Also, we wanted a barrio feel. So, you know, just tapas bars and just a, a barrio that is quite consolidated, such as the one where we bought. And with shops and, you know, the yeah. hardware store up the road. I think one of the things, if you live in the historic center of, of Madrid, often a lot of that sort of neighborhood aspect has been lost a little bit because of because of touristification. And so neighbors yeah. have kind of moved out. And you yeah. might not have a market near you and things mm -hmm. like that. Like it, it varies a little bit, but, but that was important to us. We're yeah. in Pueblo Nuevo, by the way. I should <laughs> say that. That's the neighborhood we're in. But one thing that's important is that the prices vary greatly all over Spain, depending on the region you're looking at. So I have a list here of some of the the four most expensive regions or comunidades there's 17 of them in spain so the four most expensive madrid the baleares the islands the basque country and catalonia those were the four most expensive regions the cheapest extremadura mm -hmm. castilla la mancha right. cantabria and asturias right. so asturias beautiful north and so a way you can check that is check out idealista.com tools to get a lot of market data on what the price is per square meter, depending on the region. I think that will be really helpful for you to kind of get a sense of, of your budget. Number five, what kind of property can you buy in Spain? So just to give you a heads up on some of the terminology that you're going to be finding in your search. First of all, you have chalets. So chalet is well, quite idyllic, right? Because it's a house with land. That's a chalet. Kind of place I grew up in in New Zealand. You yeah. know, you have a garden, things like that. Yeah. Uh, then you have pisos. Pisos are apartments. Two, three, four bedrooms, pisos. This and is then, a piso. This is a piso, exactly. And then you have apartamentos. Apartamentos are usually one bedroom, just a little bit smaller, but they're, they're also a piso, really. Yeah. And then you have duplex. Duplex is two or three story apartment within an apartment building, usually. Although so, you can have them also in rural areas and they can be also duplex with a little bit of land. So another question we get often is, should you buy new or secondhand? Again, that's gonna depend on kind of the place that you're looking for. Most of the places that we saw, I think all of them were secondhand mm. because we were looking at bar barrios at, yeah. at neighborhoods that were more kind of old school. This, mm. this apartment building was built in the 1960s when this neighborhood really kind of grew up. And of course, if you're looking for an apartment in the, in the historic center of Barcelona, you're not going to be buying a new apartment. Now, just because it's a historic building or an older building doesn't mean you can't renovate it inside, of course. Right. And if you're looking for new apartments, you'll also see things called urbanizaciones, a word that I struggle with. <laughs> uh, and so really what that means, it's a big apartment block and you're more, more like, you're probably going to have like a garden in the middle that's shared, a swimming pool and all that sort of a stuff. A paddle court. Exactly. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Yeah. So one thing to keep in mind is that the cost of buying a new or a second-hand apartment in Spain are a little bit different. So if it's new, then you have to pay IVA, which is VAT, on top of the price, which is 10%. I think it's a little cheaper if you're in the Canary Islands. Uh -huh. And if you're buying a second-hand place, then you have to pay a tax called the ITP, which is effectively the property transfer tax. And that varies depending uh, on the region you're in. I'll include a link to somewhere where you can see that information in the checklist. So new or secondhand depends on the kind of place you're looking for. As yeah. I say, secondhand is not probably going to have a swimming pool in it. In not the probably shared not. Area. Uh -huh. uh, and know. also there are some cost differences in there. So number six that we wanted to cover is the kind of features in the place that you're looking for. Some of the terminology that you'll see and some of the things that we took into consideration when we were looking to buy this home in Pueblo Nuevo in Madrid. So the first thing is the size. Now, what size place do you want? We were looking for a place that had three bedrooms. The reason for that is we wanted one bedroom for us, a place to sleep in. The second bedroom was going to be the office. We both work from home, so it was really important to have a place where we could put our desks. And the third bedroom, we wanted to have a spare bedroom and people come to stay, all that kind of stuff. And we started to get a sense after looking at places that really 
Anywhere that said three bedrooms but was smaller than 90 square meters meant it was going to be too small or one of those bedrooms were going to be tiny. tiny yeah. So we kind of learned that three bedrooms, 90 square meters minimum. minimum. And that was really important. Totally. Just on the size thing, you're going to see two types of size. You're going to be square meters. What is it, Yoli? Built like uh, metros cuadrados construidos, mm -hmm. built square meters. Which is the whole structure of the building. Exactly. Which, yeah. And then metros cuadrados utilizables, usable uh, square meters. Which is like within the walls. So often we checked with the, with the owner or the real estate agency, they would just put a size and we would say, are those utilizables or are those construidos? You know, is that the whole thing? Because often they'll list the bigger number, but you can't live your life within the walls. I mean, you can, <laughs> but that would be weird. So, so that was size, that was important to me. What else was important? Uh, another thing that was really, really important, especially to me, was the terraza, a terrace, an outside area yeah. that was big enough. This is one of the reasons why we actually didn't buy in the historic center, because that would be incredibly expensive. And that's kind of why it took a lot longer, I was going to say, for us to buy a house. We were looking for a year because, yeah, you know, to get all these things combined was actually quite tough. If Absolutely. you're not, you know, if we had have taken off the terraza, the terrace from our search, we would have probably found a place in two months. Yeah, totally. know, it would have been much easier because there's just not that many places that have terraces. And I do want us to do more videos. This is part of a series of, of videos about moving to Spain or you know buying a home in Spain. We'll do a house tour at some point and what the experience was like of renovating this place. So do subscribe if you're interested to see some of these videos that we've got coming out in the coming weeks and months about being a homeowner in Spain. So another feature that you're going to see listed when you're looking at apartments is interior versus exterior, which is really easy because it's interior or exterior. Mm -hmm. And interior means that if you take in a, a Spanish apartment block often you know there's apartments that are facing out to the street and some that are facing inwards and often those ones facing inwards are facing into a small internal kind of patio courtyard area and often those places don't have a lot of natural light it depends where they are if you're on the second floor of a 10 floor building facing into a small patio mm. a lot of light just can't get into that, yeah. that funnel in the middle yeah. so it was important for us to be exterior that means facing the street one of the things that you will have though with exterior is potentially more street noise mm. so you're thinking like are the bedrooms exterior if it's an exterior piso are the bedrooms exterior are they more inside the house and another thing to keep in mind is just because a place says it's interior doesn't mean that it's going to be dark. So you don't disregard those immediately. Effectively, mm. this apartment is kind of both interior, interior and, and exterior. exterior. So there's a little bit of guidance, but really when you're searching, don't get too rigid on, a, I'm going to ignore everything that's interior. So another thing you want to decide is that if you're buying an apartment, which floor you want. So depending on the kind of house you want, kind of apartment you want, you're going to be choosing one or another. So for us, for example, we wanted a big terraza, again, the terraza. So you are going to be looking at either atticos, which are pretty much penthouses, or first or ground floors that will have also maybe a, a terraza or a patio. Get, you're even. not going to get a fourth floor with a terraza. No, usually you're the, not. You're in the middle of the building. Usually <laughs> you don't. And also you want to be looking at whether there is a lift and whether that's important to you. So mm. again, we are on a first floor, no lift, but mm. hey, we're young and strong. So for example, if you go for the top floor, well, the atticos usually are going to be colder in winter and hotter in summer. So you're going to be finding that you spend a lot of money maybe in uh, electricity to pay for the air conditioning and the heating mm. as well. It's because they're just more exposed. You know, yeah. it's like the sun is hitting the roof right above you. Exactly. Okay, the next one, number seven, where do you actually look for a house? Now, you know, where do you find these houses for sale? There's really kind of two avenues you can go. Well, there's, there's three in a way. The first one would be, you know, just walking around and sometimes people would put a for sale sign in their window. Obviously that's the least efficient one. Most people now will still list it online or with an estate agency. Number two is looking online. Now there's two key places that you can look online for buying a house and actually for renting a house as well. There's idealista.es .com probably works as well, I'm not sure. Y foto casa, that's foto with an F because it's in Spanish. .es as well. Now, these are the two main online portals. Idealista is the main one. Mm -hmm. Fotocasa has less. If you have the time, check both. People often list it on both, but if you had to pick one, go with Idealista. And on the platform, you're going to see both uh, real estate agencies listing, but also you're going to see uh, direct sellers listing their own apartments. One of the key things to think about when you're using Idealista is the filtering function. You know, you're going to be filtering for the kind of place that you want, you know, how many bedrooms, they have a, they have a terrace, and something. Price. But price, big one. <laughs> but there are some traps. Now, I'm going to refer to my phone here because I don't want to get kind of confused, but I do want to give you kind of our experience 
experience of what you should be filtering for, what should you be watching out for when you're filtering. So when you're using the filters, keep in mind what you might be missing out. For example, you want a big terraza. So you click on the Atikos filter, like the top floor, but then you're gonna be filtering out all those places that are first floor with a big terraza, as we have here. Mm -hmm. So the other thing you can filter by is price, but here's what's important. Remember we mentioned that negotiation is really common and actually we negotiated down the price of our house by 13,000 euros. So keep in mind that you should put your price filter higher because you know you're gonna negotiate down there. How much you're gonna be able to negotiate? What would you say, 10%? Yeah, maybe 10%. So we actually kept nudging ours up because we're like, we're going to be negotiating down. So the actual purchase price is going to be lower than what's listed on the site. So keep that in mind. Then of course there's real estate agents. The good thing about real estate agents is that usually there are several ones in the district and they're going to be able to give you a pretty good idea of prices. They know the land, of course. You know, a good thing about them is that they can make things move faster. They can give you a really good idea of whether you're paying an excessive price or not. So, so that's good. And they can make sure that you have all the documents ready for when you're going to buy the house and make sure that it's in a good legal condition and, and all of these things. So we paid 9,000, we paid 3% plus VAT for the services of this real estate agent. And I guess the only thing that would kind of give me some comfort in the fact that we spent nine grand uh, on these people that, who did very little, is that maybe the house was cheaper because of them. Mm -hmm. And so in our negotiation process, it went really quickly. She was, the, the real estate agent in the middle was back and forth constantly because yeah. she wants to get paid. She wants to get her commission. So the previous owner, the, the previous house that we'd missed out on, which was direct with a particular, which means directly with the, with the seller, that was very slow, the negotiation process. And often I get a feeling sometimes if people have grown up in the house or have mm. a strong emotional connection, they're overpricing it. Yeah. So in the case where there's a real estate agent, maybe they can give the seller a more realistic idea of what the house is worth and just really get it sold faster. So I hope we saved nine grand by there being a real estate agent. I don't know if we did, but but I would hope so. So you found your house on Idealista or 3D Estate Agency and you're visiting. What things should you really be looking for when you're visiting? What questions should you be asking? We've got a bit of a list here <laughs> in no particular order. No. But one thing that's key is ask what the cost of the comunidad is. This is in the case of an apartment where you're in a shared building. Comunidad is, I don't know what the language is in English, but it's really the, the fees that you pay, that everyone in the building pays for the upkeep of you know, the shared uh, areas, whether yeah. that means you know, changing the light bulb and the entryway. Here in this building, we pay 50 euros, but to 60. Yeah. <laughs> but to give you some context, we have a friend who recently bought a place that has a swimming pool, that has a paddle court. Paddle is a sport we play here in Spain. A little like tennis, smaller bats. Uh, <laughs> and and he pays 50 as well. So he gets Which is rare though, like usually really? for something like that, you would be in 100 euros yeah. a month, yeah. He said he pays less because although there's all those services in his apartment, there's more people living there. It's a big complex, so it's an organization. And so really he, it's being distributed amongst more people. We're only nine different vecinos or nine neighbors yeah. in this building. So not a lot of money adds up. Pipes and electricity, really important ones is one that you were really good at, Yoli, of making <laughs> sure, you know, when were they last replaced? Yeah, I just asked and making sure that they're, um, you know, good material as well. It's not the old stuff that was made out of like copper or something like that. So uh, yeah, you want to make sure that all pipes and electricity are renovated or if they're not, that needs to be reflected in the price because you are going to have to change them. Sun and orientation, that was mm -hmm. something else we had noted down here. Yeah. Visit at various times during the day. We did that for this place to make sure the sun is where you want it. Totally. Really important. Totally. Here's one that we didn't do so much of, but I think is really important, a learning lesson for us, is talk to the neighbors yeah. and walk around the neighborhood. It's important to talk yeah. to the neighbors. If you don't speak Spanish or if you're not in the country, a little bit harder, I can yeah. understand. Mm. Also find out, and this goes, this is typical, you know, ask, particularly if there's a real estate agent, ask if they're open to negotiate the, the, yeah. the seller. You know, how urgent is it? Get a sense of their context. Yeah. And also ask uh, how long it has been in the market. Uh, yeah. You need to know, you know, if it's been like for four months and the real estate agent is uh, honest about it, then woof, something is up maybe. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing is what's included. So we got the whiteware included in this. So we got the fridge, the washing machine, the yeah. dishwasher was included in the yeah. sale price. I mean, everything was actually included, but it was just all furniture. So we didn't really want it. Uh, if you don't say that. anything, they will just leave all the stuff in here. So we were very clear that it had to be, these things were left and these things weren't left. So I think that's important to remember yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, now you've got a context of what we bought. We bought a three bedroom, a hundred square meter home 
home with a 50 square meter terraza in Pueblo Nuevo in Madrid. One bathroom, we added on a bathroom. And so, you know, first floor exterior near the metro, that was really, really important for yeah, us. Uh, you know, you're only walking 20 minutes to get to the, to no. get to the metro, no <laughs> garage. And so the price that we spent, well, the asking price originally was 270,000. Mm -hmm. We negotiated down. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about the negotiating process, because that's the process of buying the house. But we ended up paying 257,000 for this yeah. house. Yeah. Keep in mind, we had to spend about 25,000 renovating yeah. on top of that. Sure. And I hope that helps orientate you a little bit about all these things, what they kind of add up to in terms of a price. Mm. Uh, and yeah, and don't forget the renovation costs. They're really, really important. Yeah. Download the Spanish home buyers checklist that we've made in conjunction with the wonderful people at Pro Spain Consulting. Thank you so much for their help. That will help you understand these steps. It also includes the steps from the next video. So we'll see you in the next video, the step-by-step -step process to buying a house. If you're watching this in the future, then I'll make sure we've linked it over here so you can, you can click on that and link it in the description below. So happy house hunting and we'll see you in the next video. Ciao. Ciao.